Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's 2019. Um, it's 2019. <laughs> it's the last of the teen years. Does that freak anybody out? Next year we have perfect vision. Ah, uh, uh, super lame pastor slash dad joke. 2020 for all of you, those of you who are a little slow on the uptake, not that great at math. Um, I don't know what kind of person you are, whether you're the type of person who makes New Year's resolutions. I used to try. I suck at them. Um, and so I, I sort of switched up. I ch started choosing a word or a theme kind of for the, for the year. I don't know if you're one of those people who, who likes to do those things or if you're just like, you know what, I, there's no point in trying to accomplish those things because they just, they never work. But regardless of whether or not you set a goal, this is a really great time for us to sort of evaluate, to take stock of life. We've come through the Christmas season. Um, you know, the, the decorations are all down. It does feel a little bit bare. When Robert walked in for band practice this morning, he was like, it's so beige in here. <laughs> I was like, it's true. It's very beige. <laughs> um, <coughs> but it's a, it's a natural break kind of in our calendars. And it's a time for us to like sit back and reflect maybe a little bit and, and to dream about what the future would hold. I do have a love-hate relationship with resolutions. I, I love the idea of making changes, of, of setting some goals. I hate the guilt that comes with not succeeding in making those changes. Uh, I fell prey a couple of years ago to getting a gym membership in January. Um, I don't know if you realize this, but gym membership, according to Gold's Gym, traffic jumps 40% in between December and January. Um, and by the following month, it's right back to normal again. So lots of us get locked into a full year plan of paying for our gym memberships that we don't go to. And I'm all for making healthy choices. Uh, don't get me wrong, but when we guilt ourselves over enjoying the holidays with food and friends and we shame ourselves over the extra 5 or 10 or 15 pounds that we put on, uh, that's one of the things I hate about resolutions, that we would somehow taint that beautiful gathering together with friends with this idea of like, well, now we got to like shed it all off. And I heard an amen there. Uh, <laughs> A friend of mine posted a Calvin and Hobbes comic on Facebook, just one of the tiles from a Calvin and Hobbes, and it reminded me how much I love that comic. I'd sort of forgotten, it, uh, I moved into some other, like I read a lot of like Batman and, and stuff like that when it comes to comics, but when I was a teenager, Calvin and Hobbes was the bomb. That was my favorite, my favorite um, comic as a kid. I collected a whole bunch of Bill Watterson's books. Uh, I even clipped newspapers. If I didn't find the ones that I already had in the books, I would clip them and and put them into a scrapbook. Yes, I was that much of a nerd. I made my own comics. <clears throat> I'm pretty sure a couple of those books are probably still on a bookshelf in my old room at mom's place. But I thought I would pull out a couple, because every year Bill Watterson would write a New Year's resolution type uh, comic for Calvin and Hobbes. And I thought I would pull out a couple of them for you to just kind of set your mind in the tone uh, or the theme that we're going for this morning. So here is our first Calvin and Hobbes comic. Calvin is chatting. If, how many of you are not familiar with Calvin and Hobbes? Like, do I have to explain what, this, what Calvin and Hobbes is? Calvin has a, a stuffed tiger that only he sees come to life, and so he has lots of conversations with his very wise traveling companion, Hobbes. Uh, well, it's the new year, and I'd say the first 10 hours haven't been up to snuff. Did you make any New Year's resolutions, Hobbes asked? You bet I resolved to quit hiding my feelings so much. From now on, the world's going to know exactly what I think of it. Yes, you've certainly been the model of self-restraint understatement of up until now. Well, no more, says Calvin. I've also resolved not to put up with sarcastic tigers. <laughs> if I see any, I'll tell them, says Hobbes. And the second one, this was the, one of the tiles was the one that was put up this week. Uh, are your parents going out for New Year's Eve? Are you kidding, says Calvin. My parents' idea of a wild night is a mix of scoop of real coffee with decaf. <laughs> are you making any New Year's resolutions then? Resolutions? Me? Just what are you implying? That I need to change? Well, buddy, as far as I'm concerned, I'm perfect the way I am. For your information, I'm staying like this, and everyone else can just get used to it. If people don't like me the way I am, well, tough beans. It's a free country. I don't need anyone's permission to be the way I want. This is how I am. Take it or leave it. By golly, life's too darn short to waste time trying to please every middlesome moron who wants, who's got an idea of how I ought to be. I don't need advice. Everyone can just stay out of my face. Hobbes? 
<laughs> he should resolve to be more attentive when someone is speaking. <laughs> Now, I'm not going to go into the, uh, you know, attempt to tease out the theology in these comics, but uh, actually Richard Beck, who is a, a favorite author of mine, he's done a brilliant job in a series of online essays. If you're as nerdy as me and like the intersection of comics and theology, um, he did a series of online essays that are brilliant. Calvin, in case you didn't realize, is named after John Calvin, the theologian who... Um, uh, yeah, John Calvin, and uh, the teacher, I don't know if you remember any of the characters, but Ms. Wormwood is named after Screwtape's protege in the Screwtape letters, so um, nobody else cares. Okay, so moving on. <laughs> Regardless of whether or not you set a goal or a resolution, whether you have a word or a theme, my prayer is that 2019 will be a year filled with growth and change in each one of our lives. That whether you set a goal and you're set to achieve it or whether stuff kind of makes its way into your life and happens, my prayer is that 2019 will be filled with growth and change. And growth and change aren't always comfortable. They're not always easy. I'm certain that we're going to experience it here at Grace. With, with Tara's resignation, we know that there's going to be some natural change happening. But, but for me, I think I, I've landed on the word for, for change for me and what my 2019 is going to hold. I, I started with um, present was the 2017 word and 2018 was um, patience. <laughs> Foolish thing to pray for, friends. Um, and uh, on New Year's Eve, we were, we were out some, with some friends and they knew about, uh, about my, uh, the words that I choose and I, I hadn't really landed on passion or dare. Which, there were kind of two words that I was sort of like, and they kind of get at the same thing for me as a, as a nine on the Enneagram. I, I can tend to withdraw. I can tend to like not put myself out there. I can, uh, that, that's a natural proclivity for me. And so the, the idea of like having passion and letting my passion be known and to stepping out and daring sort of fit together. And uh, there's other words that came up that were suggestions on um, New Year's that maybe wouldn't be appropriate from the pulpit. So I'm going with dare is the word that I'm going to be using. I've landed on the word dare for this year. To dare to speak up, to dare to live in the moment, to dare to be there for the people that I love, to dare to dream, to dare to give God all that I have, to dare to live a life worthy of the calling that he has placed on my life. And so on my whiteboard starting tomorrow, there will have a 2019 with the word dare. So that whenever I face a decision that I have to make, whenever I am faced with a dream that I'm like, I don't know, is this the, is this the will of God for my life? That word will be the thing that will help propel me in one direction or the other. And hopefully it'll cause me to not shrink back. Hopefully it'll cause me to live a life worthy. That's where we're headed this morning. To dare to live a life worthy of the calling that God has placed in our lives. If you've been around grace for the last four years that I've been pastoring here, I hope that you have learned that I love scripture, that I love walking through the Bible, that I, I'm not really great at the, uh, um, you know, just bits and snippets and, and, you know, just taking pieces of scripture. I have committed a lot of things to memory, but I see scripture as this great grand narrative, this story of God and the story of us, and it's a story that he's continuing to tell through us. So I'm not one of those preachers that gives you five points to a healthy marriage or three steps to perfectly behave children because I don't have the answers for either of those things. <laughs> if you've been waiting for me to bust out those gems, you might be waiting a little longer because I don't see scripture behaving that way, not in my life anyway. I don't see scripture behaving in a way where I can just kind of pull out little snippets and passages and, and apply it because it doesn't work all the time. Sometimes it does. Sometimes scripture lines up so beautifully with my story and I'm feeling encouraged by a word or, or, or a, a passage of scripture that seems to just bolster my faith. But it doesn't happen all the time. Anytime I see a step-by-step -step way to anything, way to blessing or seven steps to whatever, I get a little nervous because my life doesn't seem to work in steps. I don't know about yours. I wish it kind of did. I wish it was like, oh, I'm on step two. I'm going to take a step up to step three. But I see scripture as these beautiful stories and letters of people who wrestled with God, who struggled to understand their world and the one who created it. They faced opposition and danger and they turned to God and God showed up. And I've seen it in my own life as well, but I couldn't give you five steps to follow. I could, I could tell you my story. I could tell you how I came to faith. I could, I could tell you how um, I walked away from God as a kid because my dad committed suicide. I can tell you bits and pieces of my story, but I can't give you five steps. Like if you just do these three things or these five things, everything's going to be great because my life hasn't worked in steps like that. 
I'd rather teach you to listen to the voice of God for yourself. I'd rather teach you to, to look for opportunities where instead of necessarily finding all the answers, you at least ask the right questions. That you would continue searching. That, that in some way you'd be inspired to love God, to love his word, to love his presence, rather than just giving you a checklist to follow until we meet up again next week. It's why I like walking through entire books of the Bible in a single season. Rather than just pulling out some quotes to back up my ideas, I'd rather walk through Scripture together to dig a little deeper, as, as the Hebrews would say, to like get up to your elbows in it, to really wrestle with the text. Because this book has the power to shape you. It has the power to change your life. And it has the power to drive you to the author behind the words. See, what's interesting about the Bible, the Bible is not God. Sometimes we get confused because it says in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. That Word is Jesus. It's not the Bible. But sometimes we've elevated Scripture to this. It is almost like God to us. You can't mess with it. You can't tamper with it. You can't read from the voice translation. Like, there's, there's, we have this, like, we've elevated it to this point. And I have read a beautiful thing this week that explains what the Bible is for us. How many of you have been in the ocean? Pacific or Atlantic, you've experienced ocean waves. Now, I could give you a description right now of what it feels like to have a wave hit you and knock you over in the ocean, to look out and not see anything on the horizon, how vast that ocean is. I could hand you 66 different books explaining this is what the ocean is like, how wonderful, how vast. But until you've stepped in, until you've experienced, until you've smelt salt water air, until you've had it sting your eyes, you don't know what the ocean is. Well, Scripture is like writing about the ocean. It's telling us all about this great, vast ocean, but it's not the ocean itself. It's pointing us to the ocean, that we would experience the ocean, and hopefully it gives you a glimpse that you're like, okay, so I should keep my eyes closed when I dive under the water and I go swimming in the ocean. Hopefully it gives you an idea of what this ocean is about, but until you experience it, until you get to the thing that's behind the words, you don't really understand the ocean. So scripture's like that for me. It's this beautiful thing that points me to this person behind the text. So we're going to spend some time the next few weeks in the New Testament book of Colossians. If you don't already have a Bible, make a New, make it a new Year's resolution to get one. Um, we have a we have a few copies back there. You could just grab one. Um, but don't let it sit on your nightstand or your bookshelf. Like, read it. Start in Colossians if, if you want and follow along with us. Or read Matthew or Mark or, or Luke or John. You know what? Honestly, as a pastor, it would be just awesome if people read their Bibles and lived what they found in the pages. I'd be out of work. <laughs> if digital is more your jam, download you version. It's free on every platform. You can read it on your iPad or your mobile phones. Tons of translations. There's reading plans. I'm currently reading through the Bible Project's The Bible, which is like, it, through the course of the year, it's going to take me through the whole um, passage or whole scripture. And each day there's a devotion, there's a short um, video that is done by these great scholars who make everything so easy to understand. Um, it's brilliant. It's in the Grace Events page. If you have version and you go to the Bible, you go to your more and you'll see a list. If you click on events, you'll see a little map if you've allowed uh, this thing to figure out where you are right now. And you could go to Grace Community Church or Charleswood Community Church. What's Gavin preaching on this morning? <laughs> Gavin's in Matthew 3. By setting and meeting goals, we create happiness through pursuit. I might just preach. My, this is looking pretty good. Or you could go back and go to Grace Community Church, and it'll have all the stuff for our service here this morning including the Calvin and Hobbes, all the slides you see up there, all of the scripture passages. But then it'll also give you a link to follow along with the Bible Project, our announcements, giving all that stuff's in there. So if you have that and you're already there, you know we're going to Colossians 1, 1 and 2. If you're not there yet, I'll give you a couple of seconds as we head to the first chapter of Colossians. We're going to be tackling the first 14 verses of this letter. It's Paul. He's writing. These are the opening lines. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people and Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. The opening two lines of this letter. This is a letter from Paul, who it says is hanging out with his young protege, Timothy. 
Timothy has a couple of books in the New Testament that are letters written to him, not Timothy writing them. So Paul has written numerous letters, and that's what the bulk of our New Testament is actually made up of letters that Paul has written to various churches. And this particular one is written to a church in Colossae. And Paul is literally hanging out with Timothy because he's actually in Rome under house arrest. Uh, Paul has been stirring up a little bit of trouble. The whole church planting movement that's happened um, across Asia Minor has stirred up some trouble in the neighborhood. The government's not all that excited about new revolutions starting where people are uh, taking care of the poor and um, gathering together and talking about a different Lord than Caesar. And and so, uh, so... Paul has been arrested, and he's been, he's been put under house arrest. So he's, he's in chains, but he's uh, still able to write. And Timothy is there with him. And so he's, he's in this space, and he's writing to these little churches, these uh, ecclesias. And it's important to remember that we're reading a letter. Because sometimes when we read scripture, like I said, we put it way up here and we forget that, oh, this was actually written to somebody. This was, there was an actual church that received this letter. There were other people just like us only 2,000 years ago who would have been wrestling through what it means to be faithful to Jesus in their particular culture. And Paul is writing to encourage them. And so in a very real sense, you are reading somebody else's mail when you read the book of Colossians. It's a letter sent to a church or a bunch of smaller churches that kind of gather together that represent the church in Colossae. It's a church that Paul had never set foot in. Paul didn't start this church. This is not one of the many ones that he did start. This is one that he has just heard about that has sprung up outside of his influence up until this point. Um, He'd never visited it. He didn't start it. And, And we'll see more of that as we get into the letter. But he begins this letter to them by saying, Uh, grace and peace to you. I sign every email with the phrase peace to you. I stole that from the Apostle Paul and from Rich Mullins' song, Peace, the Peace of Christ to you. But he's writing this letter and he says, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. What a great way to begin a letter. It's the kind of letter that you're going to, when you read that in front of people, they're like, okay, I'm going to listen to what this guy has to say. It doesn't start with some of the letters that, like, I don't know, maybe Scott Gillingham gets every once in a while from angry citizens who send, like, you are the worst ever. Well, thanks for that opening statement. It's sent to a church, and he begins with this, grace and peace to you, the holy and faithful believers in Coloss. And, and he goes on to say, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Because we've heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people. The faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world, just as it's been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Now this opening little package is just filled with theological encouragement. Remember, Paul didn't start this church. He didn't like set them up with the like, hey, these are the things that you need to believe. This, this church kind of happened without Paul's influence at all. But he says, we thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was making political statements there. He was making theological statements, reminding them that this Jesus that you serve is Lord, and that he came from the Father. He is God. And when we pray for you, we pray for you in that way, because we've heard of your faith. He's encouraging them, reminding them not only who Jesus is and where he came from, But he connects these believers with this one true son. You are the faithful followers of Jesus. He he immediately encourages them from, from the very first few lines. We thank God for you. We pray for you. We've heard of your faith in Jesus, your love for all God's people. Faith and love, those things go together so often in Scripture. They run in tandem so often. Faith revealed in love. Show me what you believe by the way you treat other people. Show me what you believe by the way that you love those who could do nothing for you. Show me what faith looks like by the way you treat the least of these. 
faith and love, the true message of the gospel. He says, this encouragement, this, this good news is spreading not just among you, it's spreading all over the world. You're part of something bigger than you realize, is what he says. God's at work, and, and you might not be able to see it everywhere. You might not be able to see it in your particular situation. As we get into the letter, we're going to realize things aren't all, all that awesome in Colossae. You may not be able to see it, but God is at work. Even though you question where and when, he's at work. And so there's this hope, he says, that's, that's built up in us. Paul mentions Epaphras. Now, Epaphras was likely the founder of the church. If he's not the founder, he's definitely the guy who's the overseer or kind of like the pastor or the, the spiritual leader of the church there. Uh, it's likely that he had traveled to Rome to meet with Paul and to share what was happening with the church and was now going to take this letter back and read it to those who would gather in the churches in Colossae. So this letter of encouragement, Epaphras gets to meet Paul. I don't know if they had, had an opportunity to meet beforehand or if Paul is just... Um, vouching for this great pastor, saying that you heard this from him, you've heard this great message from Epaphras, and now we've heard great things from him about you. And Paul writes them a word to bolster their faith. He says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding as the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For this reason, because we've heard this about you. We have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. I love that prayer. <laughs> I love that prayer that we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding. It, it's a prayer that I pray over this congregation on a regular basis, that God would fill you with the knowledge of his will, that he would fill you with his goodness, with his love, with his wisdom and understanding. That each of you would know his will for your life. For us, yes, collectively as a body, as those who would call Grace Community Church home, but for you as individuals, what does it look like for you to be faithful to Jesus in the sphere of influence that you have? What does it mean to have the Spirit lead you, to speak to you in a way that you not only hear and understand, but that you can live out? Because that's what Paul is getting at here. It's about not just gaining wisdom and understanding, not just memorizing scripture and learning lots of really cool things about theology. It's about how is this lived out? How is this faith become something that people can see because of the way that we live? He says that we would live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. The theme for our morning is that we would live a life worthy. That we would dare to live a life worthy. The challenge for my heart, the challenge for yours this morning is, what does it look like for me to live a life worthy? What does it look like for me to live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way? What does it look like for me to bear fruit in every good work? What does it look like to grow in the knowledge of God? You see, if you just camped out there and made that your New Year's resolution or your New Year's theme, you'd be on a good track for the year. If your goal was to, to please him in every way by living a life worthy, by growing in the knowledge of God, by bearing fruit in every good work, th this growing in the knowledge of God kind of wraps up all of that stuff before it. It's, it's not just about head knowledge. It's not just about understanding. It's heart knowledge. It's, it's your whole body, soul, mind, and spirit. It's experiential knowledge. It's, it's that deep knowing in your bones that even when darkness is around you and you feel like, I don't know where God is, you still have this sense that he's, well, he's still with me. 
That's what knowledge of God, it's, it's this loving knowledge, it's this connection with the Spirit of God that doesn't go away when we face difficult times. And bearing good fruit, well, when, when you look at your life, what sort of fruit are you bearing? Are there good things growing in your life or in the lives of those you have the opportunity to impact? Uh, do you see good things growing in the lives of your kids or your spouse or, or your neighbor or your, your grandkids? Do you, do you see good fruit growing in people around you? Are you making the world a better place on a regular basis? Is there more love, more joy, more peace, more goodness because of your presence in the places that you find yourself? Would you say today that you're living a life worthy of the Lord? If you think of all that he's done for you, you think of forgiveness and, and redemption and healing. Are, are you living in the light of that gift? Are you, are you living to, to give thanks or to worship or to, to give praise for all that he's already done? I think that's what it means to please the Lord. I think that's what it means to, to please him in every way is he has given his life for us. What does it look like for you to give your life for him? What does it look like for you to surrender some of your stuff to serve him? To walk in his kingdom, to pursue and know him. Paul continues, he says that we pray that you would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. We don't do things in our own strength and power. We need to rely on the power of God. When we do it in our own strength, we, we'd get weary. We, we give up. We quit. We, we feel like we, well, we just don't have it. We don't have it in us. But he works in and through us. When Paul had his thorn in the flesh, whatever that thing was, it was something that bothered him. It was something that weighed him down, that he felt was a hindrance to him being the minister that God had called him to be. And so he says in scripture that he prayed three times. I don't know if three times was like three fervent times or if it was like he had prayed almost every other day, but it was like three times I got serious with God and I said, look, enough is enough. I can't do this anymore with this thorn in my flesh. God's answer back to Paul wasn't like, yep, you're right. Actually, I probably should have thought of that. Uh, it's making it more difficult for you. He says, no, no, my strength is made perfect in weakness. My grace is sufficient for you. you. You have all that you need. So I don't know if Paul stopped asking after that point when he heard, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. But there are times where I have felt like I'm really weak and I don't want to keep going. I don't want to give up and I want to quit. And then I'm reminded that it's, it's not my work. It's, it's him who works. It's him who works in me and through me. And sometimes I think when I'm in that space, I, I miss out on the miracles. I miss out on seeing his fingerprints because I'm so focused on the, on the weakness, not on his power and his strength. That we would be strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. That we would have great endurance and patience. That's going to come up again as we keep digging into the letter and we see the difficulties the church is facing. They're being pressed from all sides. And, and Paul begins this letter by encouraging them. You're God's and his power is working in you. So we give joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. We see evidence of the kingdom of darkness all around us, on the daily. It's, it's everywhere. There's no shortage of pain and brokenness, but we have been rescued from that kingdom of darkness. We've been brought into the kingdom of light, and we don't always get to see the kingdom of light at work, but the kingdom of light is always working. It's always advancing. It says that God will build his church, and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Darkness cannot stand against the light. So even though we don't see it all the time, are we living into that kingdom? Do we live like Jesus is Lord? Do we live like he's ruling over this world even now? Or do we live as if Jesus' words and his kingdom are just really nice ideas, but they don't really work in the real world? I feel like that's where a lot of Christians live. It's really a great idea to turn the other cheek. But it's also a really good idea to slap your neighbor when he steals your stuff. Like, I was so disappointed this week when I read Jerry Falwell Jr.'s statements. I don't know if any of you read them regarding Jesus' kingdom. 
uh, that, that it's not, and I don't want to get too political here, but it, he was defending the president, uh, President Trump, and he said that he can't see President Trump ever doing anything that would be negative for the country. And I was like, wow, that's a huge statement to make. Like, I could make that about Jesus, but I don't know if I can make that about any human being. Um, but his idea was that, like, Jesus' ideas were really cool for, like, the spiritual realm. But in the real world, it's really great that America still kicks butt. When Jesus said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, I don't know that he was saying that Caesar's the man and just keep giving him taxes. I don't know that he was endorsing Rome's way of doing things. This article said that maybe that's what Jesus was saying. You can have an atrocious foreign policy because Jesus' words on the Sermon on the Mount don't work in real life. Now, that's on the grand scheme of things. I think sometimes we live in that reality. We don't really trust that God's word is true. We don't trust that his kingdom is actually advancing. We don't believe that he's really doing work here on earth because we see so much brokenness and darkness around us. See, either we proclaim Jesus as Lord and we live like he is, or we don't. We proclaim he's Lord, but he's Lord of this spiritual realm of heaven of one day, someday things are going to be great. But it doesn't really work in the real world. I don't know if we get to have it both ways, though. I don't know if the kingdom advances if we don't believe it advances. If we're not willing to do some of the work to, to kick back the darkness, if we're not willing to do some of the work of bringing peace into situations where there's no peace, to live as if Jesus is Lord here and now and usher in, give people a glimpse of this is what it looks like when Jesus rules and reigns, what does it look like to live a life worthy of the Lord? It looks like living as his servant now. Not just waiting till we bow in front of him for all of eternity. Do we actually believe he ushered in a new kingdom with his death and resurrection? Do we actually believe that there is something that we can't necessarily see on the regular, but is moving ahead? That there is healing for people's brokenness? That there is a way forward? beyond the darkness, that we have been called into this kingdom of light? Do we, in the words of Bruce Coburn, kick at the darkness till it bleeds daylight? See, my prayer for us in 2019, that we would resolve, if we're going to make a resolution, to live a life worthy of the Lord. And that's going to look different for you, from your neighbor, from me, but that we would choose to live in a different kingdom. That we would recognize that it isn't just that like God's words are really nice, but they don't work in the real world. They work here. They're hard. It's not the easy path. It's not the way to a hashtag blessed life all the time. But it's his way. Where did it get his disciples? Well, seated somewhere in honor, in a place of honor. But it got them martyred. It got them crucified, got them beaten. It's not the easiest way, but it is Jesus' way. My prayer is that we would dare to take Jesus at his word and make his ways our ways. That we wouldn't just go like, oh, that's a really nice idea, this kingdom that's coming, this kingdom of light. We would look for opportunities for on Monday morning, the kingdom would come, for his will to be done in us and through us, on earth as it is in heaven. So I echo the prayer of Paul over the Colossians for each one of us here at Grace this morning. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Lord, we want to live a life worthy. 
live a life worthy of the sacrifice you made as we gathered around this table and recognized that you are with us, that your body was broken, that your blood was shed for us, that we might have new life and life abundant. We want to live a life worthy of that sacrifice. So teach us. Teach us daily, Lord, what it means for us to live a life worthy. For my friends who, who work in, in random jobs where they are confronted with new people every single day, whether it's fresh customers or clients, Lord, would they, would they recognize what it means for them to live a life worthy, what it means for them to usher in your kingdom in, in those moments, even if it's just for a brief, short period of time that they have with the people they would connect with. For others who find themselves surrounded by the same co-workers every single day or, or in the same office space, Lord, show us what it means to live a life worthy, to be, to be faithful to what you've called us. We don't need to stand on a soapbox on a street corner. We don't need to be shouting, repent for the kingdom is near, but show us what it means to live faithful in this new kingdom, to recognize that your ways are higher than ours and they work here in this world. If we choose love, good things happen. If we choose grace, if we choose peace, it's not always the easy way, God, but we know that you work in and through us. So equip us, empower us. When we feel scared to speak, when we feel scared to share, give us the words to say, give us the courage. When we have opportunity to pray for and encourage others, would we do so with joy in our hearts because you are at work in us. You've rescued us from this dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of light. So Lord, have your way through us, through this week. As we journey through this book of Colossians, Lord, will we remember that we're reading somebody else's mail, but the encouragement that you gave to that church in Colossae is for us as well. That you want to encourage us to live a life worthy, to, to be filled with joy and power, to please you in every way as we surrender our lives to you. So have your way. Be gracious to us. Give us peace, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you this week. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. Amen. Thanks be to God. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday.